Okay. Hi, guys. Welcome back to The Secret Deciphered. We're having an evening with Ben Asen, the photographer of The Secret Book, and he is graciously sharing some photos with us this evening and some memories of how they came about. So, hey, Ben, how's it going? I'm doing great. How are you, Karen? I'm really having a nice night, nice and getting cold here in New York City. The heat is on. Oh, yes. The, yeah. the heat is on and good old Indiana, too. Lots of yeah, and you had, snow. And you had some snow the other day, too, I know. Oh, it's it's very pretty. It's very cold, but it's very pretty. Good. That's great. So That's I wanted to tell some, um, we need to give people some background here. We've got some great photos up of the fair folk. So I wanted to know the stories behind each one. Okay. Can you, am I sharing this now or can you see it? Oh, yeah, I can see it. Okay, but can the but can the people see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, where should we start? Um, well, I guess uh, I call I call him actually uh, Boris Johnson, uh, <laughs> but it's <laughs> it's the Philharmonic Orc. and uh, I think what Joe Ellen did was so brilliant. I mean, oops, sorry. Um, you know, she. I'm sorry, this is a little bit low res, but you know, the, the teeth are keyboards from a piano. So, I mean, she really put a lot of effort into this. And we, you so, know, I, I couldn't remember where it was shot, but she reminded me that she thinks it's at Columbia University. You know, we're, listen, we're talking about, you know, I've shot in a lot of theaters. So if I only shot in two theaters in my whole life, I would know it right away. I've shot in so many theaters. I've shot in Carnegie Hall. I've shot at the Metropolitan Opera, though I shot a ballet there, not an opera. Um, you know, I've been to rock and roll venues, uh, jazz venues in New York, like the Vanguard and uh, and the Blue Note, which is two of the most famous jazz places, you know, in New York. So I thought it was city center, but I think actually it was not. So who do you think the Philharmonic Orc is modeled after? You know... I don't know. Uh, obviously, we know it's not Leonard Bernstein, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I think Boris Johnson at that point was probably about maybe eight or nine years old. So I don't think it's Boris Johnson either. That probably rules him out. Right. So um, I'm really not sure who it's modeled after. You know, he might he might have just envisioned if he was going to make a movie and he needed somebody to play a conductor. His vision was a guy with wild hair, wire room glasses, and you know, a, a black, you know, uh, a tuxedo and a red tie. So it might not be anyone in particular. Um, I know it's not Andre Previn, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So I really don't know. But um, this was a great, a great image. It's gotten a lot of, you know, it really was one of my favorite images. Of course, once again. It, you know, it ran in black and white. Mm -hmm. So that was always a little disappointing. And then we have one of him, which I don't have here. I don't know. I could find it later, but I actually could probably find it right this second. If you hold on one second, I will find it here. Here we is. The, okay. So this is the Philharmonic Orc. Can uh, you blow it up a little bit? I am going to blow it up a little bit. And I wish I, I really, if I was, hold on one second here. Okay. And we're going to go, uh, okay, here we go. So I shot this, okay. And we decided, you know, we didn't have an, uh, an orchestra pit, which is why I think Joe Ellen's right that it's like Columbia University, because mm -hmm. I've been in their theater in the past 15 years. And I know they didn't have an orchestra pit. Now, we shot this picture in color and in black and white. But what's really interesting in this picture is that this picture ran, okay? But if you see the woman back here, that's Joe Ellen. So we, we, I was setting the shot up, and she was just sitting back there. And I took a couple of shots, right? But then we took it without her, because why were we putting her in there? She's Unless she was like Alfred Hitchcock, like Hitchcock always appeared in his movies, right? <laughs> Joe Ellen's going to be in her photographs, which would have been a cool idea, actually, come to think of it. So when I when I 
when about a year ago when I decided to sell photographs, I started going through 61 rolls of black and white negatives. Now I think there are 62 rolls, possibly. One of them is Henny Youngman, though he might have only been photographed with 35 millimeter slide. I'm not sure. But mm -hmm. so when I was making the prints up on the website to sell, I'm looking at the negatives. I go, who who is that sitting there in that picture? Why is she in there? And I go, oh my God, it's Joellen Shirley. <laughs> You'd forgot I mean, that she was sitting back so, there looking kind of forlorn. I it, love the it, photo. It, it was really funny because before I even, uh, I, I mailed her a copy right away. And uh, when you and I went up to visit her, if you remember, she had a copy of that picture hanging on the wall. So that was really, really funny. Um, yeah. yeah. That's the only picture that I believe Joe Helena Pearson. Oh, except for, well, she might have been one at the kitchen too. Oh, in, in the kitchen. That's yep, right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, this is that's such a sorcerer, fascinating little apprentice. Yeah. Like this, these little characters um, that, well, sometimes they're called bear folk and sometimes they're called dolls, but the fact that he's barefoot is really interesting. Yeah, it's very quirky, isn't it? I, I, you know, and you really can't see it too well, but actually his, the tuxedo shirt he has, it's all ruffled. And that was during this particular period when, when guys wore these ruffled tuxedo, uh, these tuxedo shirts, which I never, oh, yes. I never liked at all. I mean, I did, you know, I've worn tuxedos for weddings and a couple of jobs, but I never wore a ruffled shirt like that. I've seen a lot of pictures from my brother's prom with ruffled shirts like that. Back yeah, sure. Day. Sure. Yeah. With probably like a purple tuxedo. So uh, go back to the other, the last image with the four photos there with, um, yeah. so here you have the Frigidaire devils. Right. And so was this done in your refrigerator? And this was done. Betsy and I were living in a a converted uh, one to two bedroom apartment on 81st Street and First Avenue. Um, you know, it was our first apartment when we got married. And uh, my first son was born there. And um, that was the refrigerator. This was back in 1981. It wasn't a great refrigerator, but it worked. And Byron gave me a couple of things that he definitely wanted in there. Uh, which were what? I'm pretty sure the I, I'm sure the horseradish. I'm sure the horseradish. Uh, horseradish is used for a lot of reasons, but in the Jewish religion, for the holiday of Passover, you, you usually put a horseradish on gefilte fish, okay, which is a a cooked white fish or pike, and it really smells bad when you're making it, but when it's when it's cold, it's really good. Most people like it a lot. Um, I actually prefer the red horseradish, but my wife likes the white better. So she might've put that in there. Uh, the vodka is ours, uh, everything <laughs> else is ours. Um, the Hillman's mayonnaise, I don't remember if he told me to put that in. I have no idea. But so I have a question about, so some of these little devils were also in your cupboard where you had the devil dogs, cakes, and there was like a fork and a knife. I and mean, was all of that supposed to be a part of these Frigidaire Devils? Was that improv or was Byron telling you? That was, that was, I mean, no, that was sort of improv. We and just, do you uh, still eat the devil dogs? <laughs> you know, I had a devil dog probably about <laughs> 10 years ago. It was a kid in our building who was coming home from school and I was talking to him, nice kid, is about, I don't know, 10 years old at the time, maybe. And uh, I said, what do you got in that lunchbox? He said, oh, I got this. And well, I, you know, I ate my sandwich, but I didn't eat my whole devil dog. I said, you had a devil dog? <laughs> so uh, I did a little negotiation. He uh, went upstairs and got a full devil dog for me. And we ate it together. He, he had his half. I had my whole one. And I, I got to tell you, it tasted a lot better when I was 15 than it did now. Well, I'll have to yeah. tell you that when I saw those in the book, I had to order a box to try them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, oh, I was going to order a box, but then I had a lovely friend who was in New Jersey that sent me a box to try for my very first time. And I, it was, they were amazing. Of course, you know, 
chocolate for me and cake for him with cream. I mean, you just can't go wrong. So no, I, I wrong. thought it's and funny. You, and I know you like whipped cream. I know that. <laughs> I had to try it okay. <laughs> because it was in the book. In the book, right. It was right. at Ben's house. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so, uh, so you said the horseradish had to be in that photo, but um, did the, the double matzo, dogs the, have to be in it the, too? The, or? The matzo, and the matzo meal, which is right behind it, mm -hmm. which is what you use to make um uh make uh uh matzo braai and a few other types of foods that's it's like crushed matzo oh i cook with that and that's what i made my may from with and it's a divine divine yeah. yeah ingredient and then everything else we just betsy and i we just had it in the you know here we had you know we had the tomato and we had the uh you know i think that's an apple a pepper okay. So, um, Pepper. with, yeah. So with these little, I mean, was, was Betsy at the time thinking this is the weirdest thing. My husband is taking photographs in our kitchen with these strange looking uh, <laughs> devilish yeah, dogs. Yeah, she probably did. She probably did. Uh, you know, we weren't, we were only married about a, I guess about maybe, uh, a year and a half. So I don't think she knew what she was getting into at the time, really. Um, <laughs> But uh, I've done some other pretty weird stuff. Well, you know, I mean, looking yeah. at these things and and watching the way they've been placed is is really interesting, and it gets a lot of people thinking about you know what does it mean and where was it taken. So, the uh, garden garden goyle, where was that? Well, you know, I'm pretty sure it was actually shot out of Long Island. I, I don't remember taking it. You know, I I didn't take that when I went to Florida. I took the Dixie Pixie and I took the um, Dixie Pixie and um, and the uh, unlicensed a real estate broker. So, uh, but that definitely looks like some of those philodendrons that grow there wild on those trees. They have those in Long Island too. Oh or? yeah, oh yeah, philodendron. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. What do you what do you make of that doll? I mean, it looks like it's supposed to be part corn. I mean, I have it. I have that photo, but you know, it's like a, it's I don't know. It's you know, th there was a horror movie back in the late fifties, early sixties about a plant monster. You know, that walked around. He, he looked like like a plant. Like you know, he looked green and stuff. Though it was a, I think it was a black and white movie, but. Uh, I don't know. I think he might have based it on some type of old B movie thing or something. Um, That's what I was kind of wondering too, because it looked like you know, was it supposed to be kind of the Jolly Green Giant? Was right. it? I mean, it could you know it could be a Jolly Green Giant that went bad. I don't know. I, you know, when he went rogue or something, um, hung out I'm in not, the sewers really too long. Sure. I'm really not sure about that. You know, it's funny because you know I really never used the term fair people because. Whenever I worked with the, uh, you know, with Byron or Joe Ellen, we just always called it the soft sculptures, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I'm not even sure. Maybe they hadn't really definitely coined the, the name Fair Pibli. I'm, I'm not sure. Because that part of the book, I was not involved in. I was not involved with any of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I helped write was my bio. Uh, Betsy took the photograph of me. Um and so I really know nothing about the text at all. And I know nothing about the editing. Okay. Um, I never, I never even saw the layout for the book until it came out. Wow. Now, well, I think I remember you saying that because you had mentioned that they had cut off some of the photos you had done, which you felt were, were kind of lacking in some of the things that needed to be in the photo. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, but also, you know, I just, um, most of some of the books I worked on with Byron, if I was the contributing photographer for the whole book, he did let me see uh, the galleys, as we call it, you know. So the galleys are, you know, the pages with the text and the photos. Mm -hmm. But on this book, I guess it really was a secret. It really seems to be. There's uh, a lot of secret things within the book that I seem know. to be almost like secret lessons. But the bottom right to me this is the most unbelievable story there is because that's the boogeyman mm -hmm. now i know he liked a, a couple of jazz musicians but i don't know if it's jerry mulligan or 
I just don't know. But so we took it out to California. We took it out to LA and we took it out to San Francisco. And Betsy had a really good friend in San Francisco named Bill. In fact, he's coming here with his wife for, for Thanksgiving. We're very excited. And we actually went to Scope of the Screws with him this past summer. So Bill's coming here. Now that was on, we actually put that on the rail of his back porch. I think it was the second floor up. And we taped it down. There's like a lot of duct tape under the rear end of the boogeyman. Okay. And he's playing. Uh, playing. He's playing the sax. Playing the sax. And it's supposed to be made in the image of who? I don't know. I, I you know, I really don't know. Uh, it's very iridescent. This particular piece, I remember, had a lot of shine to it. And we also shot it at two of the Tower Records stores, one in LA and one in San Francisco. And Tower Records was the record store. They came to New York afterwards, but you can go into Tower Records in LA or San Francisco. And sometimes you'd be going through some record albums, you know, and you look across the way and, you know, there's, you know, it could be Marty Ballin from the Jefferson Airplane or somebody buying a record. Wow. So that was kind of cool. So, that is cool. What was you... interesting about this is that um, in 1983 or four, we had a friend who moved out to San Francisco. She was the wife of a former uh, uh, a U.S. admiral who actually had been at Pearl Harbor. And um, Betsy said, oh, you got to bring her a book. I said, why does she want a book? I mean, I mean, th th this is a woman that was much older, probably in her late 70s, mid 70s. So, but I gave her the book I autographed, right? So when I started selling the photographs, I got a message from somebody saying that he had gotten a copy of the original book and he lives in New Orleans. And then he asked me a question. He said, who is Consuelo? I go, excuse me? <laughs> I forgot that I had, you know, written this thing to her in the book. That is so awesome. I remember as well was a friend of ours and she passed away, you know, maybe five, six years later. And you had the book. And, um, you know, she had uh, uh, a young guy that was her executor and who knows if they put it on eBay or what. So he bought it on eBay. Wow. And uh, so he, he got the copy that I actually had given to her. So is, I guess then, one more story. No, ask me first. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask me first. No, I was going to say, I, I this is touching, I think, hearkening back to the conversation we had with, with Eric in the last uh, video where we were actually kind of talking about this and we didn't have our pictures up to be able to look at right. the boogeyman. So when you're utilizing the boogeyman in these photographs, it's supposed to be a play on jazz. Um, yes. And, you know, Byron was also a big fan of George Gershwin, who actually mm -hmm. I'm a pretty big fan of George Gershwin's myself. Uh, you know, Rhapsody in Blue is one of the greatest pieces of music ever written. Uh, so interesting tidbit about George Gershwin. Yeah. When the gentleman wrote the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Yes. And the studios tried to get it cut out of the film from Dorothy singing it. And he took it to George Gershwin and he said, this is a beautiful piece of music and it should absolutely stay in the movie. Right. And I think that that is really telling because of course we have verses that are talking about ride the man of Oz to the land outside the window and then you're bringing this up about Gershwin. It feels like they're somewhat kind of tied together. And and is that because Byron, you know, really enjoyed and loved these, you know, jazz and, you know, was he a Wizard of Oz fan and, you know, those kinds of things? Yeah, uh, yeah he was uh, a little side story. He actually did, you know, Miles Davis, the great trumpet player uh, who, you know, probably is kind of blue which is one of the great albums of all time in jazz um 
Miles Davis was also a painter. He loved to paint. Um, his paintings were very abstract. I didn't particularly like them, but people like abstract were left the stuff. So Byron was going to do a book with Miles Davis. Okay. Wow. And Byron said to me, how would you like to go to his house in Malibu, which I was shocked because I know he lived on West 75th, 76th Street. He actually was married to the actress Cicely Tyson. Very familiar with her. Who played, who played Jane Pittman. Yeah. But anyway, um, and they didn't, the marriage didn't last very long. But anyway, so I said, sure. Oh, that'd be great. And then wow. like a week or two before we were going out there to visit family, uh, Miles Davis said, no, I don't want him coming here. And I had a friend, my friend, John Romer, who was a photographer, and he happened to have a photograph of Miles Davis. And he actually, I actually worked it out to get that picture used in the in, the, in that art book. Wow. Uh, I have, I've seen the art book. I don't, you know, if it's around, it's probably like remaindered. Uh, I don't think it was a big seller at all. I really don't. Um, it would have been cool to go to Miles Davis's house in Malibu and take the photograph, but things like that do happen occasionally. I'm, I've been very lucky. I haven't had a lot of cancellations in my life. So, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you know what they say, celebrities that kind of. But the other story about this is that there was a guy who follows the secret who lives in northern Cal, north of San Francisco who is, he works for a title company. And through Google Maps and software that the title companies have now, he actually figured out by looking at the houses in the background, okay? Yeah, the painted ladies. That's what, I right. remember you saying and that in the last- and He <laughs> actually Eric, yeah. found out that it was at a particular address. He looked up who owned the house then and then he said, Ben, did you know Bill so-and-so? I go, yeah. Yeah. He said, well, that's the house where the boogeyman was shot. That's so how awesome. do you know that? He said, well, I work. and they told me the whole story about working for a title company. So, of course, I called Bill. Bill couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, uh, awesome. what I like about this picture, and I'm not going to take credit for it, really. But if you look at the houses behind him and the shadows, and even all these little peaked roofs and all those houses, you know, my favorite artist is Edward Hopper. And to me, that those shadows and light sort of remind me of a Hopper. So oh, Hopper, yeah. didn't, Hopper didn't paint in California. He painted in, in New England, you know, Cape Cod, and he painted in New York. And he painted some stuff in France. But to me, it's a very Edward Hopper-ish looking background. Mm. So I love it. Yeah. What are the other? What's the other um, kind of collage that you have? Uh, it's got Monty Irvin in it. And... Oh yes, I have that right here. Oh, some great stories here, but I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. So I want to know first of all why Monty Irvin. What kind of connection did he have to Byron, and why would Byron say we have to have Monty Irvin? Well, Byron, first of all, believed in in racial equality to everybody. And uh, Monty Irvin, you know, was the second black baseball player. Uh, it was him, Larry Doby, I think was three. And number one, I guess we know, is Jackie Robinson. Jackie well, Robinson. Jackie, yep. Yeah, Jackie Robinson, we weren't going to get. Um, and Monty... Uh, Monty was working, I believe, for Major League Baseball, and I think he was working in diversity, actually. So, um, and so he Byron, played for the Giants. He played for the he played for the New York Giants, right? Mm -hmm. the New York Giants, and he played. He was there before a Willie Mays was there. I mean, it's pretty incredible. But um, so Byron said, so we're going to photograph Monty Irvin, the baseball player. I go, wow, that's great. Really cool. He said, we're going to do it in my apartment. I said, in your apartment? You know, Byron lived in a nice one-bedroom duplex type thing, but it was kind of cramped and stuff. He said, no, no, I, I we have to do it here. So Byron went out and he got this he got this uh, poster back here, which is uh, that's uh, Monty Irvin, uh, Willie Mays, and I can't remember who the last baseball player is behind them. I'll have to look. It's uh, I just can't I, think of it right now. But anyway, I remember. I think you did like a um, 
it was like a trivia question for us on our group a while back about yeah, that. Was, but was, I have a, yeah. so that so that picture behind Monty Irvin, that was one that he went out and specifically bought to get his picture in yeah. front of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why yeah. do you think he did that? Well, I think he wanted to show Monty Irvin with teammates, maybe. Okay, and those also, were his teammates at one point. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, mm-hmm. those were the teammates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, Willie Mays is the only one left in that picture. He just, you know, Willie, Mays, I think he just turned ninety-two, maybe ninety-three. I mean, yeah. uh, I photographed Willie Mays once. He was a great guy, um, really nice. Um, I just wondered because I thought he's wearing the SF, the Giants. Well, no, no. All right. So what happened was, I think Monty might have gone over. He might have gone over with uh, with Willie to the San Francisco Giants for a year or two. I'm not sure. And probably we couldn't, Byron probably couldn't find a New York Giant hat probably <laughs> at the time. You know, now, of course, he could have gone on eBay or Amazon oh, yeah. and, you know, just ordered it. And we have it in a day or two. But uh, yeah. so, so, um, but the great thing about the story is, is that there was a delicatessen around the corner from Byron called P.J. Bernstein's. And Joellen and I and Byron, we with Monty, we sat around eating pastrami and corned beef sandwiches. That was the best part of the shoot. And that really, I mean, I remember Monty Irvin saying to me, boy, I love this delicatessen. This stuff is great. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he, he came in a suit and tie because he was actually, cor- at this point, he was corporate because he was working for Major League Baseball, which actually was um, on Park Avenue in uh, around 50th Street. It's still there, actually. Mm. Uh, so... That's what I can tell you about Monty. And so what do you think he thought about when Byron's like, I want you to stand here and then you need to hold this ferry. We, tr- you know, Byron tried to explain some stuff to him, but he said, he said, you know what? Okay. Let's just do the photos. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't that into like, you know, it just didn't really interest him that much. Was probably, yeah. And it's obviously too, when you start talking in the secret, people are like, let's put our tinfoil hats on because we're going to go down this crazy road of, you know, the secret maze of this book. Right, exactly, exactly. Now, of course, to the right of Monty is, I think, one of your, I know it's Joellen's favorite piece. That's the uh, Major Demon. Yeah, so yeah I, got, Joellen, I got to meet yeah, him. <laughs> yeah, so Joellen lived in the, in the high 50, high East 50s. And I can't remember the name of the, the restaurant, but she was able to, she, she had been there a number of times. And we got to shoot there and we did a few pictures there. And that's the one that's really, I mean, I love this photograph. I really do. I really, you know, it's funny. Um, I lit it basically with two lights. You can see one light on his face. You see the shadow, his profile, which I love. And then I actually had to put a light in the background because I wanted to get the separation of the brick column and see the sign better. So, So did you did you feel like there was a little bit of like a Hitchcock element to it, or did you, oh, were, you try, were you trying for a Hitchcock element? I was I was trying either for Hitchcock or you know anyone that did great suspense. You know I watched a movie this morning. I watched the original David Lean's version of the uh, of Weathering Heights. Oh. If you want to see a black and white movie, and the lighting, I recommend it highly. It is okay. one of the best lit films I've ever seen in my entire life. So David Lean also is someone I've always respected as a filmmaker, director. Um, and I know that if David Lean was doing this shot, he would have done it probably a little, probably about the same. He might've added, he might've done it better. I have no idea. Cause, but David Lean, he did Dr. Shivago, Lawrence of Arabia, but Weathering Heights, I always forget about that movie. I just stumbled upon it this morning on Turner and I watched about an hour of it and I go, wow, my God, the lighting is just so beautiful. And as you know, uh, I always, I have a a phrase in all my emails at the end. I always say it's all about the light. It's all about the light. It it is all about the light. It really is. Yeah. Now we go down to the left corner. But I have one more question about Major Damon. Yeah. He looks a little bit like Vincent Price. He looks like Vincent Price, but also a little bit like, you know, he's got Bella Bella Lugosi. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Vincent Price, <laughs> I, I was once walking across Fifth Avenue right near Tiffany's and walking across the street is Vincent Price wearing a beautiful suit, 
but he was wearing running shoes. <laughs> so he must have probably had bad feet or something. And that's when running shoes became very popular. After the, after the New York City a subway strike, which was in the late 70s, people had to walk to work. There was no subways. So everyone went out and got running shoes. How long uh, did that last? It lasted, you know, it lasted a while. Not, I mean, it, I want to say it lasted maybe a month or so. Uh, not more than that. It might have even been less. Um, uh, but a lot of people in Manhattan, you, you just saw thousands of people every morning walking north and south, east and west on the big avenues. It was like an exodus of some sort. It was very strange. That explains all the 80s movies when we see like uh, Andrew McCarthy walking down the sidewalk and the sidewalk so packed full of people because yeah. Yeah. they couldn't get on the subway. Couldn't get on the subway. It was just, un yeah, couldn't get, I mean, you can, you couldn't even get down to the platforms. Everything was roped off and chained off. So, uh, wow. Yeah. That's so something. Yeah. But I do love that. I do love that photo. I really do. It's nice. I, I'm going to have to order that one now and uh, put, you know, put it next to my Krugerins because I had to get some Krugerin coins right. because of Mater Damon and because I got to meet him. So that's, you know, that's one of my most popular ones that people buy. It really is. And what's really becoming more popular is the one right under him. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, spirit that. Of, spirit of 76. It was a very windy day. Joellen and I uh, took the Staten Island Ferry. We shot a lot of pictures of the spirit inside, sitting on a long bench. And one of those photos I think was used as a small photo, if I'm not mistaken, but this was the main photo. And Byron did say to us, try to get either the Statue of Liberty, which was impossible to get because the, you know, I would have had to have full control of the boat to turn at a certain angle. Mm -hmm. There was just no way I can get the Statue of Liberty. I would have liked to. It would have been great. Also, the size of the sculpture compared to the Statue of Liberty, which is a pretty big statue, the scale was so off. You could not have seen the spirit of 76. She, she would have been so small. It just it didn't make sense. And he did say to me, you know, if you can get the World Trade Center or some you know, Empire State Building, which you can see in the Empire State Building's out there, but it's way, way out. It's too small. Yeah. Well, there were the towers. There they were. You know, um, I watched those towers go up. I used to drive into Manhattan all the time under the Battery Tunnel, and you you always saw the the towers being constructed. It was incredible. So I uh, uh, I did read that there were a lot of people that in the in the Manhattan area that were really against the towers uh initially ed koch, ed koch was totally against the mayor was totally against the, the uh, towers right then when 9 11 happened and ed koch was no longer mayor it was rudy giuliani at the time uh ed koch wrote an editorial and wrote that he wanted to build the world trade center exactly the way it was when it was originally built. Of course, that would have been a mistake because engineering wise, and now we know it actually was not structurally safe as we thought it was. Mm -hmm. I don't know any building that would have been. I mean, but the point is, it's right. so funny because he hated it. And then he wanted to build it the same way again, which of course it was not. Um, yeah, that was, um, that was really a, um, a massive uh a massive hit to our society and our lives uh that yeah. we didn't realize yeah you know, what was what was happening and and being that you were in Manhattan at the time mm -hmm. and of course Byron as well uh what was the kind of you know were you calling and checking on each other i mean what was the well no i didn't call byron at all um, i was more worried about my kids actually because they were in school mm -hmm. uh, but uh, i was actually going to a job uh, uh air france uh, had an office in not too far from carnegie hall actually about a block from carnegie hall and i was supposed to shoot a group of people outside the the, the storefront you know air, uh, air france office and it was about Eight something, eight thirty, eight forty, 
And as I crossed Sixth Avenue, I saw smoke way in the difference, but like a little smoke. It looked like an, an apartment fire. Thought nothing about it. We're taking photos, and somebody came from the guy's office in the store, whispered in his ear, and the guy took off like you wouldn't believe. I didn't even know where he went. We found out later that his wife worked in the World Trade Center. Oh. She was okay. I found out like a couple of days later that she 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 survived. She got down the stairs. Uh, many people, you know, didn't. Uh, I tried to call my wife. The phones were jammed up. I had a, at the time, I even, I had a beeper. Remember the beepers? That doc, oh. you know, doctors still carry beepers. Oh, yeah. I, so um... the pay phone stopped working. So, you know, some people had satellite phones, but, you know, the cell phone was like, nobody had cell phones, really. You know, uh, not yet, maybe a couple of years later. So, and I was worried about my sons, where it turned out that one, uh, one son, the elementary school moved him into a church, and then my other son was in a private school somewhere, and he went someplace else. So they were fine, but we didn't, we didn't know until later in the day. But we knew that they weren't down there, you know? Yeah. We just yeah. want to know where our kids were, that's all. Because we didn't know what was going to happen next. Well, that's a, it is a, one of the most iconic skylines with those buildings there. And what an amazing image you got to capture um, with the dolls and with the spirit being there. Which, did Byron tell you that's the name of the doll or did Joanne? I, 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 I don't remember. Joellen might, we got to get Joellen on one of these things. Oh uh, yeah, we're going to. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying from memory why she might be able to jar my brain a little bit. Um, but uh, I did not, I'm, I'm pretty sure I did not know the actual name. Um, so what it, about the little guy down in the corner, the, the handy, handy manicure? Okay, so I didn't want to leave my in-laws out, you know. Uh, <laughs> So my in-laws lived in Scranton, Pennsylvania. My uh, my father-in-law was an attorney, and um, he also did insurance. Uh, so we drove out there for the weekend, and we brought this little guy with us. And Byron had said, "You know, Byron said I need a workshop. I need someone with a great workshop." And at that point, my father had sold his house in Brooklyn, and Byron's parents had, were moving into the city, so. Um, we didn't have so my father said, "Well, you could use mine." And I remember he had a like a workshop that which he didn't really use that much. And I said to Brian, "So what's he supposed to be fixing?" I don't care. He could be fixing a blender, a toaster, whatever. So he had the toaster. Now most of the things in that photograph were there already, like the Maxwell House tan. So oh, I know my father was a builder, and he had a little workshop. He put all his screws and nails in these coffee cans all the time. For sure. And yeah, he, he would put a masking tape on there and say, number eight, and number 10, penny nails. You know, that, that's the size of a nail um, and stuff like that. So that whole bulletin board full of stuff was there. It was a real mess. And that's what Byron wanted. It's a mess. Now, I've had a number of people contact me about the white container to the left of the handy manicure, which says 222, okay? Now 222 is a spackle. It's a brand of spackle that you use to, you know, fill in holes in the wall and, you know. So I, people have asked me questions. Well, what's the significance of 222? And I said, I have no idea. It was just down there. Are you sure you just, you didn't put it in there on purpose? I said, no, I did not. In fact, when they started asking me, I actually Googled it because we in New York, the 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 spackle I use is something called DAP, D A P. Mm -hmm. I had never seen two two two, but that's what my <laughs> father in law had. You know, there you go. You know, so I, 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 I have a question. Oil. Yeah, go ahead. Go so ahead. if it was there and it said two two two, um some people have said, Oh, it you know. Lane 222, that's a verse in the book. Uh, right. I don't know when the verses were written um, yeah. prior to you taking your photographs or after. Yeah. 
I don't know. I my I have a feeling a lot of this was actually written before the we I got involved. I just a it's a gut feeling I have. Um, I think it, he definitely felt like he had a um, a mission to educate, and I think he was going to make this a creative endeavor that right. you had to know your history and you had to know elements of geography and in some cases mathematics in order to achieve finding a cask would you agree with that or absolutely absolutely yeah definitely definitely no doubt about it um so i took that picture you know it, it didn't i don't think that picture took me like an hour to shoot i mean you know, I, I tilted the uh, tilted the toaster and I put a soldering iron in there and an oil can and, you know, and the 222, I, I mean, I did put it in there. It wasn't there. But believe mm -hmm. me, I promise I knew nothing about 222 in the book at all. <laughs> um, so uh, and the Maxwell's coffee, you know, that's the coffee my my father-in-law used for his nails. So what can I tell you? Well, that and baby jars, baby food jars. Oh, that's right. Yes, that's right. That works really well too. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so, I guess you know when I'm looking at these photos, and you know, were you shooting these at various times over the course of a few weeks, like a few months? Oh, no. This you went know? on. This went on for at least three months. I mean, uh, I mean, there were days when we, I took five or six of them, went out, you know in the park with Joe Ellen, we shot a lot of stuff because, you know, there was a deadline. Um, and then of course, you know, I had told Byron, I was going to Washington, I was going to Florida, visit met some relatives and going out to California to visit my sister-in-law who lived out there, my wife's sister. And so he gave me a whole bunch of stuff to bring out there. But, you know, I didn't shoot this for a whole year. This was, you know, um, we got it done pretty quickly. I'd say within a couple of months. We, we knocked it out. And, you know, and I, at that point I was really struggling. I mean, I, you know, I, I, um, I had a, I actually had a full-time job working for uh, 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 a school and a rehab center for disabled people, mm. or I should say challenged people. So I was doing all the photography. So this had to be done like when I wasn't working full-time. Um, and I did that for a year, but uh, you know, we, but they were the weekends and, no, we worked it out. And um, so you said um, previously, since we were talking in the same vein of um, kind of like a scavenger hunt, uh, that Byron enjoyed doing scavenger type hunts. Kids. Oh, yeah. He, he absolutely loved it. Loved, loved doing it. He would he would do that in Long Island. You know, we went we'd stay at his house for the weekend, you know, and we have a barbecue and um he always he you know he would have been a great party planner for kids that's for sure uh he loved kids he absolutely loved kids and you could tell just by the books he did you know oh, for sure every I, book I, with him was an absolute love so yeah. i have to say i i took the halloween book to read to my son's <laughs> class the other day because it's national readers week of course and so right. leo uh wanted to read this have me read this book to the class so i explained who byron was and who you were and they were the kids just loved the book so much and it was super special and leo can say it verbatim um no but kidding. <laughs> it, it, we'll have to read it for you sometime love to hear it i love to i know I, my son ivan who now is almost 37 uh when he was about 12 or 13 let's see yeah so when the when the uh, Seinfeld book was coming out, they did a book launch, you know, like a book signing uh, at the Essex Hotel in New York. And um, I, I said to Byron, can I bring Ivan? He said, oh, absolutely. Bring Ivan. Yeah, sure. So I brought Ivan and Ivan got a picture taken with, you know, with uh, Seinfeld and it was really great. And um, it meant a lot to him, you know. That's that awesome. Picture. Yeah. But Byron would so do that, awesome. you know. If it was if it was appropriate, he would, you know, bring his kids or bring bring my kids and stuff like that. Um, so whenever you would get together, and of course, the secret book kind of 
that wasn't kind of like a New York Times bestseller, uh, but has since become kind of a little cult classic. Right. Were there times that he would say, I got these strange letters from people that are looking for a cask in Vermont or whatever. And did he ever like share any of the stories? He really didn't. He kept Uh, it quiet. Yeah. He kept it quiet. And, you know, I'm sure he got letters because, you know, his address or his PO was in the back of the book. So I'm sure he got letters. Um, But we really didn't discuss it. I mean, you know, I was already working on another book with him at the same time, not the same time, but, but right after. And before that, we did, um, I think we did the Beach Boy book before this, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. Joellen did a couple of sculptures for that, and I took the photographs. Um, so we were moving on to new stuff. And, you know, it's funny. Occasionally, you know, I'll watch these talk shows with, you know, Jimmy Kimmel and then Johnny Carson, and actors talk about, oh, yeah, I finished the movie. I haven't even seen it yet, and I'm working on another movie now. Because, you know, yeah. you finish working on a movie, and it doesn't, you know, then you have to edit it, you have to score it with music, and, you know, then you have to get a date. To, and it was the same thing with books. You know, once the book was sent to the publisher, it was going to the printer. But you don't know how many books were being published. Yeah, I know that um, Random House, when I had reached out to them in New York, they had explained to me that the secret book was actually published in from their Toronto office. It wasn't actually published here. It was. It was. It actually was a Bantam book uh, at the time, and uh, it was in the, in the Toronto office. And, you know, I get I get calls all the time. Not calls. I get emails all the time. So, Ben, did you go to Toronto to shoot a sculpture? <laughs> I've never been to Toronto. So did you go to Montreal, Ben? Can we throw that one in there too? We're actually going to go this year and next year to spend uh, like five days in Montreal because I, I, everyone says it's like Paris, but it's a lot nearer. And so, um, so I never, I never went to Toronto and Montreal. I, I was there when I was like a, like a maybe 15 or 16 years old. So, uh, I, and people said, are you sure you weren't, you sure you didn't go to Toronto? I said, I know if I would have gone to Toronto. Okay. So if, uh, so if I may ask too, then, so with Byron being a book packager, would he have to go to places like Montreal and Toronto? Obviously the, the Bantam office was in Toronto, Sydney, New York, uh, I think, but San Francisco or somewhere right. like that. Um, right. So would he be traveling to these places on like a normal basis or do you know? I don't know. And, you know, it might have been done in Toronto, maybe for tax purposes. I, you know, why would it be published in Canada? It, it, you know, there, there is a reason. OK. And it's probably someone who actually did the publishing probably knows the answer to that. That person's still around. I don't even know if anyone's around. Uh, but so but I don't know why it was published there. I would tend to think, just my opinion, um, at the time, it might have been cheaper to publish it there. It could have been. Uh, you know, because no, the dollar yeah. was stronger than the could Canadian be. Could be. currency, right. which would make sense if, if I was Byron and I was thinking like, oh, I can get it published there. I can get twice as much stuff done with it. I could get the photos I want. I can get the gemstones that I want to buy and all that. And it's going to be, it's going to cost me a little less. Right. Uh, probably no different than if we were talking about manufacturing microchips in Taiwan, right? But this is the whole reason China and all these other places, because they can do some of the stuff a lot cheaper for us. Um, and on a grander, you know, more massive scale, yeah. um, for production purposes. I mean, I would, that would be my guess. I don't know, but probably, probably. That's probably true. Yeah. Yeah. I agree there. But Uh, I do know that this book has kept us all in complete and utter (laughs) mass tinfoil hat land. It is so crazy. I I, I think about this all the time. It's just, I don't, you know, I, I think it's great. And, you know, I've spoken to the family and the family said, listen, you know what, if, if he knew about this now, maybe he does. He'd probably want to do a secret too. <laughs> but, I think uh, I think he definitely had planned on it, right? I mean, he had planned on um, 
doing a, a second book based on what people were going to write in and tell him. And if you look at the back of the book, and I think it's page 220, at the very top where it says the treasure and you're supposed to check the box, like yes. if you have found the treasure or whatever. And then it says, right. did you, how did you find the treasure cat? Did you use the clues in the secret to find the treasure cast? And so when people question and they say, well, does the back of the book really matter? We've been told you just have to focus on the verses and the paintings. And, but Byron says on that page, what clues have you used in the secret? So he's expecting us to use your photographs, to use the different things that have been talked about in the book, the history, the indigenous tribes, all of these things to find and the wordplay to figure out what he was thinking. Correct. Correct. Would that be a safe assumption? Maybe. I'm, Maybe. I'm not, probably. I don't want to say for sure because I really just don't know. Um, yeah. As I tell everybody, and I've told you numerous times, we've, we've had dinner together and talked about this a lot. I mean, I really didn't know much about this. I mean, it's it's really, um, it's one of the only books I really didn't know much about. And I think there was a reason for it. He really wanted to keep it very closed and he wanted to keep it a secret. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and to be I, in the know. But there's one picture I really have to show you. Yeah, I want to see some more. Okay. Because so, we gotta we got to put some new, we got to, all yeah, right. Some other things well, going here. All right. So, so this is, this is the prep goal. Okay. Which actually, um, I shot on a staircase somewhere in Midtown, uh, near Midtown Manhattan, I believe. But the picture I really want to show you, because we shot several different ones of the prep goal. Um, and there's one I'm extremely proud of. And you, and then it was also this one, which was the color. I think this is the color one, if I'm not mistaken. Wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. No, same picture. Okay. Oh, and then there. Oh, here it is. Okay. Sorry about this. Um, That's okay. So this was shot in front of the Brooks Brothers store, which we know goes back to the 1850s, I believe. Woo! And Byron said, uh, Byron, this is my wife, Betsy. She said to us, as long as my face is not in the picture, you could shoot me. So this is actually in front of the store. I, I walked by the store about a month ago. Right down here is the plaque with Brooks Brothers, which he used, but not in this picture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the books. I love this picture. This is so iconic. And, I know. Yeah, it and really is. Yeah. Betsy looks amazing. And this interesting alligator slash... Uh, which is fascinating when you really look at it because you're thinking, is he kind of hinting towards Lacoste, right? I, I think he probably was. I mean, look at the saddle shoes. I mean, my my oldest son and my young, I think they both had saddle shoes. I had saddle shoes when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, you know, Brooks Brothers, now, you know, that store, which was the anchor store in the world, is now a, um, it's like a, a coffee bar on the first floor. I don't know what's upstairs. And they've been trying to rent it out, but but the store is gone. That's, that, store, that store is no longer exists. And the and Brooks Brothers. Around, Go ahead. And we have one around the corner actually here, but it's a much, much smaller Brooks Brothers. So the Brooks uh, Brothers were four brothers that immigrated four here. Brothers. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and then of course we know that they outfitted a lot of the civil war soldiers that's right that's right which is you know in the, the union byron that was a pretty a pretty big deal because he loved you know he loved uh and then there's this one which i really love and is this this is the this is the sorcerer's apprentice there we go there she is again and if you don't know so that is Joel and Trilling again. That is supposed to be Julia Child mm -hmm. in a bowl of whatever soup or something. And you know who that is? Who is that? I think that's James Beard. Is it James Beard? I think so. I was wondering if it was him or if it was Louis Paladin. 
Now, who's Louis? I don't even know who Louis Paladin is. Louis Paladin was a French chef that started, uh, he, he immigrated here from Paris. He started working in a restaurant in Hell's Kitchen. He was very flamboyant, smoking all the time, would be kind of that crazy chef. Like it's, you know, no soup for you. Like, <laughs> like in Seinfeld, like he was this kind of guy and he taught how to dive for, um, for scallops. So like when you go and you have diver scallops, the terminology came from Louis Paladin and he then opened a restaurant in the Watergate hotel in DC where he had his own restaurant for uh, several years until um, he retired and then, and he passed away. Um, yeah. He, he actually, yeah. He, he lived in McLean, Virginia, actually. I'm just looking up his orbit here and he had some pretty well-known people come into his, his restaurant. Wow. But if you look at his face uh, and his glasses, I thought, oh, is that who this is? Or it, or is it James Beard? Yeah, I, I thought it was James Beard, but maybe I'm wrong. You know, well, I never I never thought about it. We need to ask um, Joellen. Yeah, see, I don't think it's Louis Paladin because Louis Paladin had a lot of hair. That's and true. In, in his later years, he had a beard. That's James true. James Beard... And had James, just the little I, yeah i think james beard used to wear that thing around his neck too if i'm not mistaken but i could be wrong joellen might know oh for sure we yeah. need to ask her so so she got into the book you know that was kind of exciting uh <laughs> so. well i you know to hear her talk about how she worked for jim henson sewing the dolls for him it was like really really cool to get to hear that kind of story from her and yeah um, and be a muppets fan myself like growing up and even right. today right and then this photograph yeah oops what happened there okay all right uh okay so this is the teen angel i love that one the black and white version and we shot this in uh, uh, in, uh, in Venice, uh, L, you know, L.A. Uh, he said, find an old car, you know, like an old 1950s type car. And we did. This is a 1953. Um, is this a Nash Kelvinator? This is a, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a Kaiser. Yeah, Kaiser was a that. Kaiser, company. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, we were very lucky to find this. It was beautiful, beautiful mm. car. So, uh so is this a is this a uh you know it's it's just a typical you know elvis type picture though it's not supposed to be elvis presley at all it's just supposed to be if you saw okay it feels like it's supposed to be like james dean well yeah so if you saw rebel i was just saying if you saw rebel without a chorus there mm -hmm. were a number of guys that wore those type of jackets you know um so that's and and yeah. when you think about Rebel Without a Cause, you think about where it was filmed. It was filmed in Griffith Park. That's right. The Griffith, Observa Griffith Observatory. Right. Uh, right. In Griffith Park. And um, that's where the quote unquote, like bloodless knife fight or something is listed in the book. Right. Um, which I find kind of interesting because then you think, well, is is that a clue for looking around? Griffith Park versus San Fran, which I know I can say that and people are going to be thinking I'm insane and like, what are you saying? But, you know, we like to think outside the box here since we know the cities aren't confirmed and it's important to look at those things. And because of your sculpt, you know, your pictures and her sculpted art is just, um, these are all kind of pieces of it. Yeah. And then lastly, I think, Let's see here. Ah, oh, that's a good one. The, type of, the typographical terrace. This so was, this enlarge was... this, and I want to see what does that little book say on the left. Yeah, the, this was shot in Byron's office in Byron's Byron's home, which was his office at the time. Um, now, what are you looking for? So I know that the the dictionary that's why, that's is why above. I, 
Oh, the but, yeah. but the little book there to the left. Well, you know, it'd be my left, I guess it I'll, would be. I'll, I'll be honest. I cannot uh, make no, no. that. No, Other side. Oh, here? Yes. Yeah, I can't read it. It's way out of focus. Oh, boy. It was meant to be because we, we were really just working on uh, on the typewriter, really. Uh, uh -huh. So I really can't tell you, you know, where that was. But um, hold on here. I'm just going to make it a little smaller. I mean, all right, here we go. It's fascinating when I see, like, I know that that's a random house dictionary that's sitting behind it. Uh -huh. Oops, sorry about that. Um, yeah. yeah. It right. is, I, I have that same dictionary, uh, but I've always wondered what the little book was there to the left of it, um, on the left side of the keyboard up, you know, on the yeah. left side of the, yeah. So I'm, just kind of curious, like what he was reading and what that was. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that white out on, on the keys. Yes. Uh, most of that was there already. <laughs> that's kind of funny yeah he was he's not the neatest no it's not the neatest guy you know he always looked perfect byron tie suit but you know uh his his office was pretty interesting i have to say i think i could probably relay it mine's kind of a mess currently but you know i mean he seems to be such a brilliant mind that it makes sense for why there's like this the the chaos and the brilliance so to speak Right, right, yeah. Okay. That's amazing. Ben, thank you for sharing these. I wanna do some oh. more. You wanna see a few more? Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, we, we um, I know I, I don't wanna keep you, but if you wanna uh, show I, us. I, I, this, so I can do this all night. Um, I'm looking for one that I really, you know, well, you know, to me, the, the unlicensed real estate broker. Actually, I'm going to show you the color outtake and the black and white. Um, you know, this was based, you know, Joe Ellen, most people probably heard the story already. Uh, Joe Ellen was fortunate enough to be part of the 25th anniversary of Playboy magazine, U Hefner's iconic magazine. And there was an actor by the name of Robert Morley who was a great British actor. He was in the Lady Killers and a lot of great English movies in the 50s. He played butlers. And anyway, so she he, she had to do a sculpture of Robert Morley for an article in the, in the book called uh, Why the British Like to Dress in Drag. Okay. So it was very successful photo, uh, sculpture. Got a lot of great... Great comments. It also was in the same issue. Was the 25th anniversary uh, issue was uh, interview with Marlon Brando, which Hefner had been trying to get Brando for a long time. So uh, I have a copy of that somewhere downstairs in my basement in a file. I have to find it. I think there um, was a copy for sale at a used bookstore. I saw. I'm sure. A while I'm back. sure. I'm sure. Um, and, and then the color one, which is also really kind of cool this is the outtake um okay so wow that's, that's the awesome one. yeah yeah really great and that's the uh, tower in chicago i can't think of the name of the tower in chicago but um well it was it used to be the sears tower building right i'm, I'm not sure or is that a different tower that you're different i think that's a different tower. because the sears tower is black black yeah yeah i but this is i know i know it's in chicago i'm positive it's in chicago i, I remember asking byron about that but just you know byron said find the piece of land that has a for sale sign i was down in miami visiting an uncle some family and he took us out to an area called kendall and all this all this green behind you now is houses i mean thousands of houses for miles wow. but at that time it was just vacant land Actually, some of it actually was farmland. And uh, the farmers sold out and they made a lot of money probably. And then they built all these houses. That so that is, was that was kind of a cool shot. I really like that shot a lot. That's amazing. I could see why Byron would probably want to definitely get some.
photos of Florida and we have a quote unquote Florida painting, but I, I know that in the book, he mentions the ladies home journal. And I don't know if, uh, if a lot of people understand that, um, Mr. Bach, uh, created that book, but then developed the Bach tower gardens in Tampa Bay. Right. And so, uh, I want to say his name is Edward Bach, B O K. But it's fascinating just to think like how Byron had you go do these photos. It makes me wonder how much of that history he really knew. You know, he was always reading uh, and, he, and he loved history. So I, you know, I would say he just, he learned about it. You know, he, he was so into history. I actually had uh, one of the history teachers that he had at, uh, at Midwood High School. Of course, Brian was four or five years behind me. Uh, and uh, we had some great, great history teachers uh, at Midwood, really, really good history teachers. Uh, they're probably good science teachers as well, but I wasn't very good at, so I didn't like science very much at the time. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, I, and, I loved history and I love science, but I thought to myself, when you say he's he was always reading, um, you know, what was he like in an advocacy way? Well, he always fought for the rights of kids. And he was really into making sure that all kids know how to read. And, uh, you and know, he was on the board for the UJA, right? On the board the United Jewish Appeal for a certain, I think it was the, the publishers group. At the UJA, it's sort of like broken down into like, you know, lawyers, accountants, business people, and the publishers are, are, are separate. I actually went, I actually went to a dinner um, uh, after he passed. Um, Sandy invited Betsy me to a dinner. Uh, I think it was at the Hilton Hotel. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, look, he believed in racial equality like nobody, you know? That's amazing. And, I feel uh, like we could get that sense from the book, but hearing you say that gives confirmation to the things that, you know, that we're looking at and researching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ben, thank you so much for oh, it was great doing this with us this evening. And, and I, and we will get the next one on the books for in the coming weeks, whenever you have some time to visit and sure. chat some more. Yeah. And I want to wish uh, everybody, Karen, you and your family and everybody listening, a great Thanksgiving. Let's hope it's a real good one. It's great family getting together again. And I'm looking forward to seeing my son fly in from LA, which, you know, for a couple of years there, we didn't see him at all. So oh, that'll be wonderful. We're thrilled, and I'm sure you have some family coming up to see you too as well. I know your daughter probably will be with you, right? Yep. Yep. My daughter's coming home and, uh, it's going to be a nice holiday to get to be together and, and make some good food and appreciate the fellowship and the time together. Okay. That's great. That's great. Well, signing off. We'll see you soon. Bye everybody. All right. See you next time, Ben. Have a good night. Take care. Thanks. Bye -bye. You too. Bye-bye.